Hi, I'm Pete Davis, the director of uh, the Democracy Policy Network, or DEEPEN for short. Welcome to the Green Buildings panel. Uh, this begins uh, three sessions of policy panels, and we're really excited to uh, be here today. I believe Caroline dropped out, but we'll get to her. Um, we have two wonderful state legislators and a wonderful interstate activist here to talk about the exciting potential for where buildings fit into, uh, into our green energy future. So we're gonna start by going around the panel and each of you taking about two minutes to introduce yourself, where you're from and how you got involved in the cause of green buildings. And in doing that, you might explain some of, um, some of the policies that you've advocated for. And then we're gonna spend the rest of the panel going deeper into recent green buildings bills that you have promoted. And then we're gonna open up uh, questions to the audience. So why don't we start with you, Representative uh, Dewar. Um, introduce yourself and how you got involved in green buildings. Uh, thank you, Pete. Uh, let's see, where to begin? Uh, so I first became interested in green buildings actually in college. So I attended Syracuse University for architecture and I rem distinctly remember a professor saying to us at one point that the building industry was the most energy intensive building, material intensive industry on the planet. And I did not know how to reconcile that with being an environmentalist. And so um, I did my thesis on a green building tribal co tribal based co housing project. Um, and then I moved to Seattle, actually hoping to pursue sustainable architecture. And um, that didn't quite quite pan out. I became a stay at home mom, but now I'm full circle and um, working in the legislature. I come from local government. And um, so all of my interests are kind of congealing <laughs> in the Washington State Legislature. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited at the work that I'm able to do and, um, and pushing good policy forward. Over to you, Representative Rammel. Thanks, Pete. And Davina, I didn't realize you'd, uh, you'd gone to Syracuse. My, uh, my brother graduated oh. from Syracuse. <laughs> Well, Another we'll connection. <laughs> um, so I'm Alex Rammel. I'm a state representative uh, here in the 40th district in, in the northwest corner of Washington state. I, I live in Bellingham. The 40th includes um, traditional territories of the Lummi and Nooksack and Swinomish and Samish people. Um, I, I was appointed to join the legislature um, just shortly after Rep Dur two years ago. Um, and I came to that with a background in environmental advocacy. Um, and uh, environmental policy and planning. And probably most relevant to this conversation today, I, I spent a number of years managing uh, the Community Energy Challenge, which is a uh, regional program here funded with uh, uh, American Recovery Act dollars back in 2010, 11, 12. Uh, working to help um, homeowners, uh, small business owners, implement energy efficiency retrofits and create uh, green jobs. Um, so that's some of the experience that uh, brought me to, to this, um, this body of work. Thank you, Representative Rammel. Uh, Caroline Spears of Climate Cabinet, um, your intro. Hi, y'all. Nice to be here and nice to see everyone. Um, my name is Caroline Spears of Climate Cabinet Action. We help candidates run, win, and legislate on the climate crisis. Uh, and um, very excited to be here. We work on the campaign side and on the legislative advocacy side. I'm not in Washington State, but in some other places, although I'm calling today from Washington's 23rd uh, state ledge district, which is a beautiful and exciting place to be, looking out over the sound right now. Um, and uh, so we help folks on the campaign trail design climate policies and platforms to help them win uh, and connecting the dots and turning and climate into a, um, a uh, political asset on the campaign trail. Thank you, Caroline. And actually this panel started with Caroline where they do a similar work to what Deepin is doing specifically on the climate crisis. And I asked Caroline in Climate Cabinet, what is the most exciting, promising state policy at the state level um, for uh, addressing the climate crisis that other states should emulate. She said, you have to look into what they're doing with buildings in Washington. And so let's start with you, Representative Rammel. You pushed for HB uh, 1084, 
which was about clean buildings. Could you explain a bit um, about how that came to be, what it literally is that other states should uh, presumably try to copy, mm -hmm. and a little bit of the story of advocating for it? Sure. Um, and uh, Caroline, appreciate that uh, <laughs> recommendation. Um, so uh, last year, Washington State um, had a year-long process to develop uh, what we call the 2021 State Energy Strategy. Um, that included uh, stakeholder feedback from uh, all the folks you'd anticipate um, need to be at the table to think about how are we going to meet our energy reliability goals, um, afford maintain affordability of the energy system, electricity, uh, heating, cooling, transportation, industry, all of those pieces, um, and um, and meet our climate targets. Uh, Washington State two years ago adopted um, science-based international treaty compliant targets to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 95% by 2050 with meaningful important benchmarks um, each decade along the way there. Um, so how do we do all of that? The good news is our state energy strategy said we can do it and people will actually be paying less for energy um, as a percentage of their income. 30 years from now, we can hit all of those targets. Not easy, but but it's doable. Um, and, and really what sort of stood out to me from being part of writing that plan uh, because of work that had been done before um, I joined the legislature, we already sort of have um, a plan for how our electricity sector can get there and a path that is being developed and, and you know, an understanding of how that path can can advance. Um, and, and it's a little bit less far along, but still believable that there's a plan for um, the transportation sector. How do we get uh, that sector decarbonized? Uh, and meet those goals. But we didn't really have something in place for decarbonizing our building sector. And so that's really kind of the genesis of the idea for uh, House Bill 1084. Um, it brought together uh, a number of themes, uh, was governor's request to legislation, Governor Inslee um, and his team uh, helped develop the policy and advance it. But basically it sort of pieced together a number of different things, including updating our building codes um, and limiting the expansion of gas utilities. So first thing to do when you're in a boat that's sinking is stop putting new holes in the bottom, right? Um, but then we also, um, we have a, um, a building performance standards uh, monitoring and benchmarking program for larger commercial buildings. Uh, the uh, 1084 would have expanded that to include more buildings or so existing building stock would uh, be on a pathway um, towards improved energy efficiency. Um, and then we wanted to get the uh, energy utilities involved. So that means uh, gas companies, um, it would have set a clean heating standard and um, it had provisions for what we call uh, beneficial electrification, which is really just kind of a fancy way of saying that all the electricity customers benefit if they have more peers to share the fixed costs. And so our electric utilities should be helping um, with that sort of decarbonization of buildings and bringing them along. And then of course, uh, the other pieces that are critical to that are workforce and making sure that as we're creating these jobs, that they're good jobs, they're well-paying, that have career paths that are equitable and accessible to people. And then um, it's, it's also really important that that transition, again, 30 year timeline to do this, but we need to make sure that we're not leaving people behind and especially folks who own buildings or live in buildings that would be expensive to retrofit. And for folks who don't have a budget to do those upgrades, we need to make sure that there's a plan so that they're not left holding the bag of aging and expensive um, gas utilities. And I guess uh, the, 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 um, the punchline to the whole thing is that uh, 1084 did not pass this year, uh, but we're we, we did implement a handful of pieces of it through other bills and through the budget process. And then um, looking to reinvigorate um, some of those important provisions uh, as we look at next year's legislative. And that, that shows the power of having a big bill that gets a message across, gets a coalition together. And even if it fails, you can get it, you can split it into pieces and get some parts of it through through others by normalizing the idea and the discourse. And we'll talk a bit more about strategy later, but I wanna to move to Representative Dewar. You also pushed HB 2405, which was the C-PACER bill. Could you describe the story of that and what was in that? 
I can, although it's not anything new and uh, exciting because so many other states already have it, but I'm happy to explain it. It's, it's basically a funding mechanism um, whereby a, a commercial building owner can obtain a loan for um, building efficiency upgrades. And in our case, we added seismic retrofitting and lead pipes. That loan travels with the building rather than with with the um, with the owner. And so uh, a, a typical commercial building is only owned for about five years. So that really disincentivizes making any big um, upgrades to a building. But, but having it done where it travels with the building, you're reaping the rewards immediately. And then future owners know what they're buying into uh, and they continue to pay off that loan. Um, and it, it provides for a low cost way to make those upgrades. You've also pushed for HB 1099, which was about the state's comprehensive planning framework for climate response. And you have a background as an architect and you know building an urban policy. And I'd love to just, any reflections on that and how you're thinking about planning and urban policy with regard to the uh, climate crisis in Washington. I'm happy to. So um, in Washington, we have something called the Growth um, Management Act. And what that is, intended to do is to um, identify sort of a region um, in which we grow and then protect sp from sprawl. Um, it hasn't worked exceptionally well. Um, it, we're, we're better than LA, but we, could, we still have work to do in terms of really um, incentivizing density. And so what 1099 aims to do is add climate change as a goal, as the 14th goal in the Growth Management Act. Currently there are goals such as transportation, housing, land use planning, et cetera. Um, but the goal of 1099 is to require um, the 10 most populous counties in Washington to meet greenhouse gas and vehicle miles traveled reductions. Um, and the way that that would be done is through their um, comprehensive um, plans that are done every currently eight years. And um, commerce is, is to provide a, a list, a menu of items um, from which communities can choose. And everyone anticipates that, of course, uh, among those items um, to achieve those goals would be increasing uh, housing density. Um, and the idea is it would be increasing housing density, probably in uh, providing for um, active transportation, um, all in an attempt to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and vehicles mile, vehicle miles traveled. Um, we're, we, are focusing a little bit more on vehicle miles traveled than greenhouse gas because we learned recently in the last year, studies have shown that um, our salmon populations are being affected by tire rubber that's making its way into our streams. Electric cars are not gonna help us with that. And so that's why the focus on vehicle miles traveled. Um, the other piece of the bill is um, all communities, unless they're of a certain size, uh, less than 6,000 um, residents in a city and less than, I think, 20,000 in a county, have to um, plan for resiliency. So that means planning around future flooding, floodplains, wildfire, uh, wildfires, um, drought, all the things that are being exacerbated by um, climate change. So those communities need to be looking forward and not not planning to put density in areas that are at risk or increasing risk to those things. So that's a really, really short recap of a pretty major big bill. And um, although it didn't pass, it, it did make, make it through the House and it made it all the way to the Transportation Committee in the Senate. Um, but we anticipate uh, success next year because um, the House and Senate agreed on um, in budgeting to fund the planning for that list that commerce, that, that menu of items that commerce um, will be providing to communities from which they can choose um, how to go about reducing their greenhouse gases and vehicle miles traveled. So 3.4 million, I believe, is what was allocated. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that with that sort of investment, that means a commitment to moving it forward um, in next session. Thanks, Representative Dewar. Uh, Caroline, I'd love to hear about what you've seen in Climate Cabinet that made you excited about kind of uh, promoting what's happening in Washington. And if you've seen other green buildings pushes in other states that are worth uh, our audience of state legislators across the country hearing about. Yeah, well, when we talked a few weeks back, Pete, we, we were talking about the importance of state and local government 
and how critical that is for solving the climate crisis. We talk so much about, you know, the federal government takes up so much airspace and so much airtime. And we're talking about, you know, what are specific examples of things where state and local government have not just outsized impact on climate, but they're literally doing things that the federal government can't do. Doesn't It just doesn't have the same level of authority. And so buildings and what um, Representative Dewar is talking about with um, uh, transportation planning and, and that this is really the area that if anyone is listening in and you're in local government at any level, if you're in state government, this is where this is where we need folks in local and state government to really focused on solving the climate crisis. And I think Washington has done such a great example of that and diving in to say, OK, we're a state. Let's look at all of the menu of options available to us with the legislative authority we have, with the budgetary constraints that we have, that the federal government doesn't and let's, let's make the most of it. Um, and the other exciting piece about buildings and, and um, local planning is really, not only can you operate at so many different levels of government, there are things in here that work in purple districts. There are things that here that are, they're passing state legislatures and they're passing in, in local areas um, and they're not um, really slanted to one they are slanted and they tend to be slanted to a particular political party, but there are so many opportunities for bipartisan bipartisanship. And I think we saw that with the CPACE reform that um, Rep. Dewar um, championed and, and we're seeing that in, in areas that break, there are definitely breakthrough opportunities here um, for, I, for climate. Can yeah. Can I add to that um, yeah. actually? So one of the things and um, that, that comes up a lot, especially with 1099, is understanding how strapped local governments are for money. And one of the ways that we're strapped is because of sprawl. Um, the expense of, of um, extending infrastructure, whether it be roads, sewers, um, stormwater, that's all super expensive. And so density is actually a way for for local governments to make the most of their money. There's a concept called crop yield. Um, there's a TED talk about it, which talks about, um, you know, the money made per acre for property tax um, for like a Costco versus a downtown store. And it's, you, it's, you can't even compare. And so there are a lot of good arguments for density that should appeal to across the aisle. And I think also, I think Representative Rommel, some, something you've been focused on that's really, um, that really gets at this too is also all these layers of government at the state and local are so interconnected. So I like when you're talking about reducing greenhouse gases in public facilities, that's something that if you're on a school board, you can do something about that. You can do something about how clean the air is in your kids school in the buildings that your kids go to school in. Um, and that's something that you've been working at the state legislature level for how to actually clean up the air, reduce the carbon pollution coming from from schools as well. And there's something that you can do when you're on school board. It's like one topic area and you can attack it if you're on school board. You can also uh, attack it at the, at the state legislature level as well. I, you know, with both, with some of these bills that we're highlighting, we want to be honest and realistic about it that they, you know, as you mentioned, some of them did not pass. And so I'd love to hear, but what we're all about at Deepin is raising up ideas. We're calling the state house futures, not state house already a consensus. Um, you know, things that are coming up the pike and show promise. What lessons do you have in terms of strategy of what you learned from getting it, getting your bills as far as they did on these topics and what you're looking to for the future to actually get them across the finish line uh, to the representatives? Um, well, I would say, uh... What I've learned um, is really working the bill and, and being serious and intentional about meeting with stakeholders. Um, we tend to think that uh, we can't get people on board, um, but, but you can. And um, you know, one of the, the biggest challenges for 1099 um, was county and city uh, associations. So um, Association of Washington Cities, Association of Washington Counties, I spent many, many, many hours in discussions with them, trying to understand their concerns and really working to address them in the bill. And eventually, um, you know, we got we got a new, we got to neutral with the counties and we got to pro with the cities. But it takes a lot of work and and serious intention to understand 
um, how to make it work for them because if it works for them then then the bill's actually doing something and if it doesn't you'll get resistance and and you won't it won't be a win um, so i would say that's probably the biggest thing is just really um, meeting with stakeholders and trying to understand from their point of view um, how to make the bill better Yeah, one hundred percent. And and specifically in in building policy um, around decarbonization, just uh, building on Reptor's point there. Um, one of the things that I struggled with last year and I uh, intend to do a better job of um, going forward is understanding the uh, differentiated needs of different construction trades. Um, and as we're talking about building different kinds of buildings in the future. Uh, there's the potential for winners and losers uh, between different uh, categories of uh, folks working in construction. And so to me, it's really important to understand uh, those those consequences and those implications um, so that we can try to address them, try to respond to them um, and make sure that we're not sort of in, in, in short. Um, supporting folks, just supporting folks whose job is predominantly uh, working with electrical systems um, while seeing losses for uh, folks whose job is, uh, you know, burning, uh, putting in systems that burn gas and other fossil fuels. Um, that's that's a really tricky and complicated. And I, I don't have <laughs> I don't I don't have all the answers, but I think uh, Rep Dewar's point there of just really sitting down and spending time and trying to understand their needs and interests is critical. Caroline, is there any, um, as we come to the final few minutes of this panel, are there any common critiques you hear from these state level pushes um, that, uh, it, that you hear often that other folks who wanna bring these types of bills to their state um, that, uh, that you hear that you could kind of share in advance and how you plan to, how you found effective in terms of rebutting them? Yeah, there are kind of two pieces that have been uh, that have come to the forefront. One is at what's already been mentioned, building trades, building trade associations. Um, they can be really helpful. They can also really block a lot of progress when it comes to updating buildings and making sure they're clean and climate friendly. And um, there's a huge opportunity here to create millions of great high paying jobs throughout America. Um, but and, and there are twice as many people work in energy efficiency than work in the fossil fuel industry. But there's the, the work, the messaging work of saying, hey, you're actually working in an energy efficiency job. You're working in, in this job category that's so necessary. There's people don't see, people in HVAC don't see themselves necessarily as part of the clean energy future when their jobs are. That's what they're doing is they're creating the clean energy future. So having that um, conversation really early is something that I've heard a lot. Um, and gas utilities are, are um, a tough pattern um, that's kind of emerging across the US. Um, we've seen a big push from gas utilities to kind of halt some of these measures. I mean, they wanna burn more gas, it's their business model. So that's a pattern that we're seeing kind of across um, the other, the positive pattern is that really focusing on health and really focusing on um, indoor air quality, which is pretty bad. I mean, I have I have a little air pollution monitor that I bought for wildfire season, and I found that actually I was picking up a lot of toxic, volatile organic compounds and particulate matter in my home when I was burning gas for ga a gas heater. So um, the health impact and getting the the health community on board has been something that's been really beneficial in multiple states and in, in talking about this. Thanks, Caroline. Any, in this final minute, any tips, encouragement, final words for folks who wanna bring uh, this policy to, uh, to their state from anyone on the panel? Uh, give me a call <laughs> if, you, if you want a larger conversation about it. I think, I mean, I, I think don't be afraid of, of sometimes making incremental change. It doesn't seem, like you're making change, but incrementalism is a thing for a reason. So don't be afraid of taking small wins where you can get them. Um, and uh, yeah, just keep plugging along and, and, and doing the work. I mean, you really have to work your bills and sometimes you can't please everybody, but if, if they know you're listening, that goes a long way, even if you can't address all their concerns. 
I'd, I'd just add um, not to take uh, take our eyes off the the big picture. I think it was really valuable for Washington State to have that. Um, 30 year greenhouse gas reduction target that we can point to and say, that's our commitment, that's our promise, and that's what we have to do. And some steps um, are just not gonna be sufficient. So we talked a lot about renewable natural gas, which is single digit percentage improvements, hydrogen that's too expensive and too far off to meet those goals. And so once you have that, that big picture, um, it, it helps narrow your thinking to the kinds of solutions that you need to be able to, to achieve it. Do you have a way of um, putting out our contact info for anyone who yes, wants? Yes, we are going to drop your contact info in the chat. And um, and we if you follow us on statehousefutures.org and fill out the survey, we're gonna make sure to send out contact info for each of those. The whole point of this is not just what you're experiencing in this panel audience, is just the initial taste of um, of the expert advice and the experience of folks who have been fighting for this. And we hope it's the beginning of the conversation, not the end. So we'll end on that note. Thank you, everyone. You